myself and Andy and curated a thing called Visible Secrets, Hong Kong's women, Hong Kong women filmmakers. There, it was a real sort of moment, um, and, and still is in a way. There seems to be a lot more uh, women filmmakers in Hong Kong, and some were very well established at the time, obviously like Anne Hoy, and some are more up and coming, like our, our mutual friend Jesse Tang. Um, so, what, what do you think is about the Hong Kong industry that has been made it easier recently for women, or do you think it's not that special? According to my research, ever since Astra's trajectory was never broken, there's always a woman director in there, at least one woman. Uh, we're talking about from 1937 all the way down now. Every year, there's at least one woman making a film, which was pretty rare uh, when you compare to even Hollywood. They had uh, like a between Dorsey Asner and Ada Lupino, there were six years, nobody's making film, only Astra did. Well, before, I think it was before Catherine Bigelow, I think she won an Oscar recently, um, we actually had on this stage, if anyone remembers, the only woman previously to be nominated for an Oscar, which was Lena Wertmuller, um, an Italian uh, female film director. Um, interesting fact, if anyone remembers that. Um, but anyway, maybe we should open out into uh, any questions that you've got that you're burning to ask. Louisa, thank you for a wonderful film. Can you, can, there's so much information here to all of us. Can you tell us again, how many of these films by Esther Ang are still available? Um, are, in what formats are they available? Golden Gate Girl on VHS, uh -huh. uh, and uh, Murder in New York Chinatown still exists in print. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful. It was incredibly moving. <laughs> um, I have two questions. Yeah. I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about the music, because the music really draws you in. The composer is uh, Robert Alice Gaber. He's Australian. His first film uh, composition was for Zhang Yintou, Election 2, which is a gangster movie. Mm -hmm. And he composed her for him, but Zhang Yintou didn't like the, the test cues. Now he said, oh, these are too Chinese. Uh, <laughs> then uh, I listened to them. I really love them. I told Robert, I can use these for Storm Under the Sun. We were joking, we were saying, this music composed for a gangster film can be used on a political drama. And he, he said, yeah, Mao's the biggest gangster, like something like that. So, so that, was a, that was the first collaboration. This is the second. I know it was the jazz age. He recorded with a Vietnamese band, which show on the credit. And I asked him to compose the big band bit. as a director. And then secondly, I wanted to ask you about her sexuality, because it's sort of, it, it's very striking how, in some ways, it seems kind of incidental mm -hmm. in terms of how people narrate it. In the first six versions, I didn't deal with it. Most of the magazine articles was not made in, uh, making a big fuss about that. There was a fact that in Cantonese opera, it's a normal practice for male impersonators, but they're actresses. And one of the very famous one is uh, Yin Gin Fei, uh, Yin Jian Hui. I saw an article on her and uh, on Esther, they were published in the same magazine. But she is performing on stage, so in a way she is more visible than Esther. Then I discovered uh, a 1938 article that was written by a younger journalist. He was totally amazed. She's the strangest person I've ever seen. Maybe I'm too young, but I don't think I will ever meet another person like her again in my life. I didn't know how to deal with it, and I read uh, Judy Smith's directed by Dorsey Osner. Then I find that there, there's a lot of parallels. My film was first shown the April Fool's Day, and it was shown in, uh, in Hong Kong Film Festival. And I went to Columbus to find Judith in May. I sent her seventh version of my film. And then uh, so she, she watched that. She was the last person to be added in there. You're right. Like, is there, could Anna Mae Wong be one of the rare actors in history who upstaged Marlena Dietrich? And I thought it was um, much nicer having her doing, doing this job than the voiceover. Thank you very much, Louisa, for a wonderful, wonderful, inspiring film. Absolutely great. Because I was astonished by her style. And, and did, did it came, were there any magazine articles about, about just her sense of dress, the way that she presented herself? 
they were very similar. And Georgie always, they had a tailor-made suits and shirts, so she brought all of them. And then she had men's shoes that, uh, that I also observed. And uh, the Chinese magazines described her as uh, walking and behaving uh, like a man, often carrying a camera with her. Her hair was always well done. We were always having a bad hair day every day right now. They were like having a good hair day every day. So <laughs> the, the great one as well, though, was um, a bit when it said not just the style, but she also, and she has feelings like a man. Yes, so that, well, I wouldn't if men actually have feelings, but also um, <laughs> it's just a nice, like, a, well, a strange way of putting it, but a nice way of putting it. I just wondered um, when gay women were accepted in Hollywood or in Hong Kong for that matter. That's the thing Judy's men ask and then say, why did you go so open? It's not like a Hollywood is a welcoming lesbian filmmakers with open arms. It's a choice that uh, they made. But in Hollywood, uh, then, uh, within the circle, they know who's the gay filmmaker. The film called The Woman which had 130 speaking female roles. That was the original version of Sex and City, actually. <laughs> that was made by George Cooker, who's a gay uh, filmmaker, and everybody knows that he's gay. There might be these circles, and then uh, there were suggestions in these, um, say, Hedda Hopper, and then these gossip columnist uh, uh, columns, and then, but they were really recorded only on the margins of the history, and then the no orthodox history record this. Was she ever involved in the hegemony in, in Hong Kong you know, after World War II? And the second, most of her work uh, were like melodrama. She fit into the Hong Kong film history nicely because uh, it was the first golden age of filmmaking in Hong Kong. Was, Shanghai was occupied and Hong Kong was not. There were about two, three years, in, everything was moved to Hong Kong, and she came in the right time. She had a, she had a, a couple of these patriotic films, then uh, mostly it's social satire centered around a woman, and it's always um, unfulfilled love. But I was amazed with it's a women's word, or 36 Amazons. Just from the idea, you know that uh, it has to be a feminist film. I'm just quite curious about, I know so even know more whether it's deliberate or not, I couldn't tell. But I think there is a, a general tendency of um, ignoring someone like her who doesn't really belong to this group, she doesn't belong to the other group. But then uh, if you look at the uh, women filmmakers' history in general, then you would see all of them were sort of forgotten. Okay, any more questions? Um, I wonder if you could say something about the 600 photos that turned up. In February 2009, a box containing over 600 photos was delivered to my office. The box, recovered from a dumpster near San Francisco's airport by a valet shop owner, Mr. Jack Dooley. Mr. Dooley was asking for a price too high because a local wrote to him, friend wrote to him, Hong Kong film archives wrote to him, but they are actually the same people. <laughs> but he thought that they were competitors and he could uh, like them. But so, so in the end, it all comes to James Wan, and then after three years, and gave up, and so he, he sold it a sort of a half price of what he asked originally. And then uh, James Wan just purchased them uh, with his own money and make a donation to Hong Kong film archive. But Lo Khan knows too well that it, if this thing goes into the archive, you will never be able to use them freely. So, so he, he made an arrangement. I scanned all the photos before it went into the archive. That actually gave me an entry to everybody. Everybody was like seeing these photos. Wow, you sure did lots of research. But that was actually the bit that was not my research. Uh, but then uh, people felt that uh, uh, they want to share something with me. Thank you for showing us this film. I'm thinking that uh, there might be some similarities between, between this film and this film you made before. Why do you want to use animation in these two films? Instrument or the sound, the, the, um, the animation were used to lift up that burden of history by lending it some irony. Those were inspired by the political cartoons, which are not animated. But then uh, this one, yeah, from the beginning, I thought of uh, doing all these um, transition sequencing animation with music. Will there be more versions of the film? Are you gonna... <laughs> uh, uh, everybody is trying.
trying to get me to cut something out. The Chinese American community want me to cut out Dorothy Asner. And the women filmmakers sort of, uh, they were like, uh, it's, it should be a film about women. Why Bruce Lee is in there? <laughs> you know, question like that. Well, yeah, well, we can't wait to see your next work and welcome you back here again. I'm sure uh, you will come and share more films with us in the future. So thank you for making the trip. Amazing film. I really, really enjoyed it. So everyone, a round of applause. Thank you.